<laughs> and one more thing to test. It works. Welcome to Clean Architecture, a 12 months journey to clarity, I say. First of all, I would like to congratulate the organizers for the first ever real software conference in Timisoara. They did a really good job. And I'm proud to be here. <laughs> My name is Pat Koschaba. I live in Timisoara. Technically, I am a team lead at Sineto, but in the past few months, I started to move. Uh, <clears throat> migrate towards software and uh, product architecture. If you've seen my talks in the past, uh, for the past three, four years, I was talking about people skills, leadership, and so on. But today, we will do architecture, and we will actually see some code. Before entering into more details, I think it is very important to have a clear context and a little bit of history about myself, about the company I work for today, and about the projects we will see. I started coding, learning coding about 20 years ago, or I think that was exactly 20 years ago when I started at the, the university, and I got my first job the next year. And I was using a Spark computer in 2000. That was so cool for a student. Of course, I knew nothing about programming, design patterns, architect architecture, standards, and so on. I barely scratched the surface of programming, but I was scratching my head a lot because I was assigned to a new project to work alone in a programming language I never heard about. Maybe you neither. It is called Tickle TK. I was given two big books and told, OK, do the project. And what is the project about? Write a microprocessor simulator for a microprocessor called Dwarf. Probably you never heard about that, but it's OK. The whole process was uh, very intensive for me. I had to learn a lot without exactly knowing to which direction to go. But at the moment, I was very happy. I was the student. I had a job, high life. And uh, in hindsight, this was the project that opened my eyes towards software development and made me curious and passionate about doing it. However, after finishing my studies, I somehow ended up in network administration, Linux servers, and so on, until 10 years ago, where a company called Sineto hired me as a junior or mid-level software developer. I was very lucky because it was the moment when the company started to ad adopt agile principles and practices. And back then, it was, I believe, one of the first three companies in Romania who knew about agile. And I had an opportunity to learn a lot. Did I change the slide? No? OK. <clears throat> I learned a lot about TDD. Agile principles, practices, solid practices, domain-driven design. And because we started the project at the same time, I had the opportunity to actually apply all the stuff I read in all those books. In 2014, I discovered conferences. I really liked them. The first one was in 2014. That's a picture taken by me. The person on the stage is Gerard Mesaros, the writer of X Unit Design Pattern. And uh, after that, I went to a lot of conferences. And at some point, I realized that we have an experience and some knowledge at, uh, that I learned at the company that I can share with others. And uh, I believe that I was the first person from Romania to ever speak at Agile conference in the United States, which is the biggest conference, Agile conference in the world. But enough about me. Let's get to our project. The main project was started in 2010, and it is still ongoing, of course. Imagine it as a big server with a lot of disks, our operating system on top of it. And at the beginning, it was just for file sharing and data protection, like a NAS on steroids. At some point, we realized that we have this machine with a lot of CPU and memory. Why not run some virtual machines inside? That was before the term hyperconverged, which is known today in the industry, was defined. But selling hardware and software is not enough anymore. 
in, in a connected world. So we ended up creating a new project to offer connected services for these devices and our end users. And this is the project about which we will talk. It is called Sineto Central and it is a service uh, as, a as a platform. It is used by the end users, by the devices themselves, and by us, the company. I don't intend this to be a presentation about the company, but I want you to understand how and what this project does. <coughs> so end users can do fleet management, license management, and so on of their products. And uh, the, we, the employees, can do uh, manage orders, clients, and products, and so on. The project was started in 2017. At first, it was a one-man show, followed by a small team created around the project. It was built uh, from the start on uh, modern and well-known frameworks like React, Express, SQLize, and lately TypeScript. And today, it is composed of a set of multiple microservices. At the start, it was just one service. In 2018, a year ago, the original programmer and team lead left the company, and I ended up to take over the project as a team lead and as the responsible developer for the backend. So the rest of the presentation will be about the backend and not the front. The backend was created in Express, JavaScript, and SQLize. The project just came out from prototype and ended up in production a couple of months before I took it over. And um, it doesn't matter how well-intended you are or how agile is your company and the team, sometimes it happens that software ends up in production even though it was not ready. It was working perfectly, but from an architectural and code standard perspective, there were, let's just say, some issues. So, my manager came to me after a month or so and asked me to add three fields on the product entity. Sure, how hard can it be, right? We have SQLized, we have... After two hours, I realized it was a three days work. But why? The project was organized like this. As you can see, There is no architecture representing anything but frameworks. If you see this, you know, okay, it's an express project, maybe some SQLized stuff mixed in there. But what does the project do? Who knows what the project does right now? Nobody, because I didn't tell you and you cannot figure out from there. So I couldn't figure out either. And when I started to look for the files I have to change to introduce those three fields, I found this. On this screen, you can see about 15 to 20 files highlighted in blue. And these are just what I could find yesterday uh, when I uh, took this screenshot. One year ago, I am certain there were 30 plus files I had to modify. And many of those files had several methods outputting or uh, requiring the product objects in different ways. So I had to do like 60 or more changes just to add three fields on an object. That's insane. So what can we do to make it better? Clean architecture to the rescue. I read the book about uh, two months before I started to work on this project and started to apply a few ideas on the previous project. So I said, okay, let's try it. What, what is clean architecture? To define it in a single sentence, it is agile solid principles applied to modules instead of classes. But if you try to do this, you will observe that there is a problem. Okay, I applied a single responsibility principle to a module, but what classes should go into which module? For this, Clean Architecture introduced uh, some metrics, which are pretty easy to understand, but uh, they are a lot of them. So Clean Architecture is complex, but not hard. Because of this complexity, 
I decided that for this talk, I will just take three ideas from the book and show you how we applied them and, and how the project changed. If you are uh, curious, the book is called Clean Architecture, written by Robert C. Martin. And if you scan that, it will uh, bring you to the Amazon web page. So, the book recommends to organize your project in one of two ways. Either you go and make your main folders or main modules, the layers from the clean architecture, from the schema, or you make your modules the entities from the schema. Let's analyze it a little bit. So in the middle of the circles, we have the entities. These are the business rules that are essential for the business, not for the application. Think of them stuff you would do in the same business if you wouldn't have a computer. Then there are <coughs> the use cases. These are application business rules that add extra functionality on top of your business. For example, when uh, an end user first powers on one of our products, it goes through a setup screen, a first time setup, like when you power on your TV. If there is no product or no license for a product uh, recorded in Sineto Central, they won't be able to use the product. So this is a limitation or a feature which was introduced by our business logic through our application. Then you have uh, the interface adapters, the gateways, uh, presenters, controllers, and finally the rest of the stuff, like uh, frameworks, databases, web, UI, and so on. So what if we try to create the project? On the left, you have the original screenshot from 2018. On the right, you have a screenshot as the project is yesterday. Instead of Express, Framework, SQLize, what you see are our entities. You can see products, maintenance services, email module, and so on. And inside each of these modules, there is a mini architecture. All or only some of the architectural parts can be found in each folder. So we have controllers, uh, ACL implementations, router, presenter, which are part of the framework side. Then we have uh, factories, repositories, gateways, and uh, which are part of the adapter side. Then in each folder we may have uh, services, which are our use cases, then have the real models for the products from a SQLized perspective. And of course, we also have our tests here. We will see later why. So far, this was a big step forward. But what you've seen was the result of a much longer process. This started a year ago, and it is still in progress. To decide which classes go into which folders, Besides just saying, okay, I do this architecture here, we employed a lot the single responsibility principle you probably know from uh, Robert C. Martin. It says a class should have only one reason to change and that this principle is not about code, it's about people, it's about actors. So when someone asks, when the product manager asks for a change, then it should happen only on one module which is used by the product manager and shouldn't affect anything else. So let's get back to our examples with the three fields. Information about products are seen on the user dashboard as well, of course, but requests from the product manager to add those fields shouldn't make me change the user dashboard, right? We employed again some clean architecture ideas. I uh, zoomed in on the bottom right where you have a little schema. Please observe that in the top left of the schema you have that object called presenter, which we found very, very useful because 
all of these controllers had their own method to present the products. They were from different modules. Even if I reorganized the project, the controllers still called the same calls from the, to the database and outputted the, the JSON formatted by themselves. So we started by extracting presenters from the product controller. Then, from each of the other 15 or so controllers, we extracted the relevant code and moved them to the presenter. What we ended up was only two representations for the product model, instead of 15 or 30 or how many there were at the beginning. One representation for the client facing requests and one representation for the in internal facing requests. The internal products may have some sensible information which only we can see at the company but everybody else can see the other representations. Okay, but how we did it this? First of all, we created an example here, a user presenter. Presenters can talk between each other and a user presenter uses a product presenter. Then in our router, which is a work in progress, we created a presenter of type user presenter and passed it to our user controller. And in the user controller, you can see that it receives a presenter of type presenter. Each presenter um, has a base class, everybody extends the same class of type presenter. And then it just calls presenter present. No more any controller knows anything about how the output is formatted. And each module representing a model or a business entity has a, an assigned presenter. So now the user controller will still show the user dashboard with the user product information inside, but without any knowledge about products. And this led to the following improvements. So how many files do I have to change now for the three new fields? Well, I have to change one presenter. I have to create a database migration for SQLize because frameworks. I have to update the SQLize model for the product because frameworks. And maybe I have to change one controller and uh, one use case if the new fields are uh, connected with some new logic. So that's a 10 times less modifications needed and 25, seven times less du code duplication. And two extra tips. Move tests close to the source code. When I started to work on this project, there was a huge test folder without any organization. Just a test after test after test. And I asked myself, okay, which are the test files testing, let's say, the product service. That was difficult to find. But if you take both your unit tests and in our case our API tests and keep them in the same module, you will be able to focus on that module when doing TDD and when uh, just trying to update some tests because you don't have to keep in your mind two directory structures and jump from one place to another. And uh, Another interesting thing was switching to TypeScript. But why? Why wasn't it good? It was written in JavaScript. Why not keep JavaScript? So the project was one and a half years old when I started to work on it. And in those one and a half years, there were four different JavaScript standards implemented on the project at the same time. So now how should I declare an object? Should I create a class? Should I create a function returning other functions? Or should I create a function returning a closure? 
So we just went with something standard, TypeScript, because you have to write a little bit more, but you get types, and the code becomes much more expressive. Then we started to initialize all our objects in the application's entry point. That would be your app TS if you are on Express, or in uh, our example, it was the router TS, but that is just for a, a temporary place for technical reasons. The idea is that you should have all the objects initialized when the application starts. Those are your instances, and they will live as long as the application runs. If you do proper typing, you won't be able to create, for example, uh, cyclic dependencies, which we actually had about three, and it was difficult. No, did we clear them? <laughs> yes, yes, we did, says my colleague. <clears throat> okay. And uh, one more thing I like about TypeScript and uh, strongly and statically typed languages is that if you are working with uh, beginner programmers or mid-level developers, they may or may not understand design patterns. If you are a really good programmer and you know how the patterns are implemented theoretically and you apply the pattern on a dynamic language, you would end up with much less code and much less classes. Instead of five classes, you may end up with two. The pattern is still there, but it is hidden. If you have to write the proper interfaces and you have to extend the proper abstract classes, that makes your code mirror the schemas from the book. So it is much easier to explain to your junior colleagues that is a factory pattern, and these two pages from this book will always help you understand that code. So just to recap before we finish it, please try to make your architecture in a way that reflects what the project does and not what are the frameworks it is built on. Try to apply the solid principles to your project so that uh, Clean architecture is respected. Try using presenters. They are magic. I tell you, they are magic. Adopt a strongly and statically typed language and keep your tests close to your source code. Thank you very much. If you scan that, uh, you will get my contact details. I am open to any type of questions in the coffee break. And you can also send me an email or contact me through LinkedIn. All the links inside the QR code. Thank you very much.